Divine Truth Training Material Training material generated by Jesus, Mary and others for assorted topics and projects. In the third part of the Introduction to Environmental Recovery Training, Jesus gives an impromptu introduction to the subject of environmental recovery to invited guests and discusses the necessity for action, multi-generational destruction of the environment, the recovery cycle, sustainable recovery, and introduces the ideas of learning from God and utilizing plants, organisms, and ways to support full environmental recovery. The training was recorded on the 4th of January 2017 from 1 p.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Pretty good, huh? That bit on saying that um, crops and plantations and that need more <laughs> fertilizers and that. Yep. We had a, um, a mango plantation in Darwin and had thousands and thousands of mangoes trees, and I was responsible for doing all the cash flows in that work. And every year after a five year period, after five years, we had to increase the cost of the fertilizers and insecticides by 20% every year. Yeah. It's the same with every f form of farming, the way we're currently doing it? Yeah. So it's it more and more expensive to produce the same amount. In actual fact, it starts producing less. It produces less, and so you've got to feed it more, and then it produces the same amount, but it never exceeds the original. No. And, and this is the problem with the type of farming we're using. We're doing more and more to get less and less. Exactly. Yeah. Plus, it's not the right thing that we're adding to the soil. See, we're not adding life to the soil. We're not adding life to the system. We're adding things that are dead to the system. And while that feeds things that are alive, we're only adding certain chemicals and certain processes to the system, and that and that's causing. So one of the so one of the ideal things to do would have been between the trees, dig a trench and start filling them up with um, scraps and things like that. Yeah. Yep. Any stuff you take out, any rubbish, all goes into the system. You need to recover the system and, and get the living organisms back into the soil of the system in, in particular. Um, and as, as Corny's found on his property, the more you do composting type systems or, or chemical based systems, the less you get out of the soil, not more. And, and the, the thing that gives the thing to the soil, the thing that really creates the soil is not the matter, the dead matter. It's the life that's in, that's eating the dead matter mm -hmm. that creates the life in the soil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you use a mic though, because they might still, they'll still be recording. Yeah. So yeah, the beauty, the beauty of doing it that way is that you end up with a, with a system that the more you're doing, the more life is going back into the soil, and then the soil becomes more productive. Once the soil is more productive, now you don't have to worry about feeding your plants any additional fertilizers and so forth, because the soil is already doing it through its natural processes. Yeah. But the pro problem with monoculture is that, is that we take out all the supportive plants and we put in one plant and it's not sustainable over hundreds of years. It's only sustainable for a short period of time. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say to you, Bob, when we went up to the bunyas too, it's like um, one of the observations was there wasn't a lot of like, not like heaps of um, material on the ground. You just sort of pick it up, might be a couple inches thick sort of, and you yeah. think up there, so many trees and so much going on. There's got to be so many nutrients coming from somewhere. And I couldn't understand why that was until I understood that the, um, what's, what the little creatures and that make, what it comes out of them is the thing that actually has all the good nutrients, all the good stuff in it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So it's like the humus that they make is the, the quality stuff. It's their excrement, basically, yeah. their waste. Yeah. That is giving you the soil productivity in the soil. So, yeah. like at Corny's place the other day, um, his excrement going into the soil <laughs> is it, adding to that. Yes, but it's not my excrement. It's what it's the not creatures his excrement, that do though. to it. That's the food for yeah. the. That's, that's the food. Yes, that's yeah. the excrement is the food for the creatures that produce the right thing. Mm. Their, their waste that that we need in the soil. You, you see, want the stuff that they produce. Not yeah, what comes from them, not from me. Yeah. So a lot of us could be collecting, um, because you know, at our place we get 
you know, a 30 litre bucket of scraps every few days for the garden. We could be collecting it from our neighbours and things like that as well. Yeah, so rather than going to the dump, if you separate your waste, bring it all here. We'll, we'll yep, get rid of it. exactly. <laughs> because you live in a rural area, it, um, here in Wilkesdale, there is a big dump, as like a, what do you call it, a, a, a refuse station. So they actually take that and they take it to the dump. You can just put a sign in front of your house, all scraps here, and people just start putting it in, 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 in receptacles. But you've, got to, you've got to educate people. You know, often they don't separate the scraps or anything, but... When I say separate, you know, they need to, anything that's not, not decomposable needs to be separated. So you want to get rid of all the plastic and, the, you know, from the cardboard, we strip off all of the sticky tape, you know, and things like that. So you want to get rid of all of that. But Yeah, I didn't initially, and it's, it's coming to the surface now, all course. the sticky tape. Yeah, because it's not decomposable. Yeah. yeah. In some big areas, we haven't done it. We're just going to see what happens, but yeah. But in smaller areas, you need to at least do that. You know? But you think about how much waste goes into landfill. A lot of the waste can be broken into two areas. The first area is decomposable. And any decomposable waste shouldn't be going there. It should all be going into gardens and stuff like that to produce these systems that give the intelligence back to the system. And then there's a second form of matter like plastics and, you know, nylons and plastics and those kind of ma ma that kind of matter all of that is able to be chemically processed and and made new plastic and new nylon out of you know that can all be chemically processed and then there's matter like glass and you know other things like that that are, that are actually all decomposable as well but much longer time frames do you classify mm. tin in that category yeah. as glass yeah tin and glass and nails and furniture and you know all of that stuff so all of could, it so you could dig a big hole and throw furniture into it yeah yeah but you take out you take out the chemical side of it the foam so, so you take out the foam and you take out you know the chemical most of the chemicals if you can because you want to process those differently you want to process those chemically right so waste the trouble with having landfill is that we put all of our stuff in landfill and we don't process the chemical stuff chemically and we don't process the waste stuff in a in a natural way so so we, we're doing two things wrong we need to process the chemical stuff chemically and we process the rest of the waste naturally yeah yeah but you if you think about it that way how much waste would the average household produce just a bunch of plastic nowadays that could all be processed chemically um yeah the rest of it most of it is decomposable so it all can be processed naturally even right down to furniture and <laughs> clothes and all sorts of things most of them except for the nylon ones you know yeah. yeah but remember the nylon ones are great for in the sandy areas you could layer the bottom and <laughs> use them as the basis for your for your system at least get some water into the system first and then other areas because nylon's not uh, not a, it's not so toxic. You know, obviously there are certain things that are toxic, which obviously you'd want to avoid. But a lot of unnatural products that we've chemically constructed are not toxic. They don't give off toxins so much as just don't decompose for very long periods of time. And those could be very useful as waste in areas where sandy soil or deserts deserts rocky places where you could line the bottom of things and use them as a as a sort of bin to hold water yeah so there's all sorts of roles of what a lot of the stuff you know we could use eventually over time organisms will be produced through that system that would decompose those particular things obviously dams that aren't holding water would you still use the nylon and carpets and things like that on a base or ponds? Well, dams by nature are not a good concept because, you know, they, they there's a number of problems with them. Um, firstly, they evaporate huge amounts of water. So in a dry environment, you don't want open water systems. You want, you want water soaking in matter. 
is what you're aiming for, you see. So you really don't want to have dams that are open. You want somehow for them to be covered over so they don't evaporate. So the water doesn't evaporate, isn't it, in a hot, dry climate. So it's okay to have dams in wet climates where they where you know there's constant evaporation process you know and and you know there's going to be lots of water around but in a dry climate you want to somehow have the water collection mixed with matter so the so the matter soaks up the water and it acts as a sponge a slow release over time yeah so i don't know like a leaky dam a leaking dam is probably better from the environmental perspective than one that doesn't leak because it's letting water into the water table slowly. Um, yeah. I know it's not very good if you build a dam and you want the water there, but... You could use it as a massive um, soak pit, like you were saying. Like You could actually start filling it up with cardboard, with matter. matter. That's right. Should actually be a really good idea. Yeah. And you'd, in that location, you'd produce a lot of life, obviously, because mm. it's an area where there's still water gathering. So you could produce a lot of life that way, yeah. Huge. Yeah. 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 So it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you've got to, you've got to give it, you see, it's like you've got to give it a lot of these environmental things, you've got to give it thought about what God does and why God does it the way God does it. There's always a reason why the natural processes all work the best. It's like, it's like a seed that's planted compared to a tree that's planted. Isn't it? Like the seed always goes better. Everyone knows that. Like it's, it's not just a, it's a fact. The seed always grows better. Why is that? You see, it's because the seed is conditioned to that environment before it begins growing, whereas the plant is conditioned to a different environment before you've put it there. Uh, so you're putting the plant in an environment that it's not conditioned to, therefore it's not going to do as well as a seed that's grown up conditioned to that environment. You see? Peter? Yeah. In um, a book I was reading about, they, they measured little sapling trees that were a metre and a half high and they're 150 years old. Yeah. And everyone thinks, oh, well, you know, that's just crazy. But these trees live till they're 500 years old. And so in the cycle of them, yeah. that 150 years to really grow slow so that they get all the core of the tree real strong. And that was yeah. like the essence of what made them then be able to live at 500 years old. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And that's the same with a lot of stuff. We don't know enough because most, in fact, natural processes on the planet are still the most unknown things. One of some of the most unknown things on the planet, really. There's very few people interested in anything that does not aid some kind of manufacturing or uh, material support based process, right? Which is, which is obviously a big problem because we're reducing our information and knowledge right down to a very small fraction of what it could be. Mm. And therefore limiting our ability to actually live and, and successfully th thrive in an environment that, you know, is, that could be constructed based on our higher degrees of knowledge. Mm. It'll be totally sustainable, yes. The reality is if we had the earth producing uh, in a forest-like state, it could sustain at least 60 billion people. 60 billion people, 10 times the current population. And yet the average scientist on the planet believes that the world's population is too great to be sustained. Yep. So that would create, uh, that would support 60 billion vegans. Mm -hmm. yeah. 60 billion? Vegans. Yeah. yeah. But it won't support 60 billion meat eaters. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. In fact, if the current population of the world all ate meat, the world would already be in an unsustainable place, already. The reality is that many of them don't eat meat because they can't, they can't afford it and they can't 
there's not enough meat where they are and so meat becomes like a delicacy um yeah and and more than two-thirds of the current population of the planet don't regularly have meat so fortunately because if they did we'd be destroying the planet at at three times the current speed of destruction yeah so thank goodness for the poor people <laughs> who are not destroying the planet as much as the people who can yeah 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 there's a lot of things to consider with it isn't there and there's a lot of things you could teach about it that's what i feel there's so many areas I, I say to mary frequently there's so many things i could think of where i could create a fantastic business just another one would be great would be a, a mum and dad training business <laughs> training people to become mums and dads <laughs> I reckon that'd go great guns. Man, before I was considering having kids, if I knew about that business, I'd go. <laughs> you know, if it was valid information and so forth. You'd definitely go, wouldn't you? Well, most people, when they look at having kids, the reason why most men are terrified of having children is because <laughs> we don't know how to, what to do with them once we have them. <coughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And then you could have, you know, there's so many businesses like that that could be developed in harmony with love, of course, that would have a huge uptake over a short period of time with very little, you know, the, the reality is, uh, is that I'm currently presenting principles about God and God's laws and God's universe, but the reality is you could just take a subset of what we're presenting, reduce it down to its common factors, and spend your half of your life or your whole life developing scientific principles associated with it that are validated and then teach that to the world and still have a very fulfilling life, right? Yeah. Yeah. Possibilities, huh? Yeah. It just requires people willing to <coughs> do the hard yards. And there's not that many people who are willing to do the hard yards nowadays. Everyone wants somebody else to do it first for them. You know, that's a real problem. But, you know, you think of the average person in the Western world, if you talk about them living on the breadline for the next 10 years because they were developing a concept, you know, the average person wouldn't do it, would they? Yep. For us from 2004 till 2014, I basically had no zero dollars in the bank at the end of every month. <laughs> Ten years of that mm. so it just requires people who are having the same attitude to a lot of different things like the family thing the bringing up children thing the you could have another one about marriage and you could have another or partnership and you could have another one about growing things and you have another one about the environment and fixing environment you have another one about farming and sustainable farming of course and then you have another one about science and energy production and waste. man just waste production waste management and man you could go on you know you think of every aspect of today's life you could create something in harmony with divine truth that would last a, forever if you just had the motivation the desire and the willingness to carry it forward with proper experimentation and validation so that you could teach it others in a in a manner that that is believable because you've sustained it with scientific data yeah courtney was it you sharing with us um last week about somebody in in, in india um took on this business of um collecting everybody's rubbish and then being able to sustain the township with power or yeah, something? pretty much you could see the damage done to the river by everybody washing shitting in it and stuff and 
not been <laughs> at all good. And so he created a big, um, what we would sort of see as a, a multi-storey car park just with showers and toilets and used all the waste from there to go into a bio, I can't remember what they call it, and they put all the dry, dry matter from around the um, places, kept it all there like a recycling thing, and it made some um, methane gas, which um, served all the electricity they never had for the people so they could do the cooking and lighting and everything. And what come off that too is all fertiliser. So it helped heaps. Everything was a benefit to everybody. Yeah. yeah. It requires people taking ideas and turning them into reality, doesn't it? Yeah. And doing so even amongst whatever opposition happens. We're so easily put off by opposition. Mm. So much so that a person could just say something like, oh, no, I don't think that's a very good idea, and you're put off already before you even begin <laughs> a lot of times. Yeah, yeah go I'm on. just going to add to what you're thinking there, saying there or asked about. Um, what they could do in ta plan planning develop, uh, plan town planning development is the same principle. It's just like instead of having your tip way over there and your syringe treatment plant there, put them both together so the people that bring all the material in the dry matter to yeah. go into the biodigester could create electricity for the whole community, really. Yeah. It's a renewable resource. I mean, you're cropping every day. There's always trees and stuff coming in every day, rubbish. So yeah. they're available. Yeah. But they're just so far apart, they haven't put them together. In the end, I think the best systems are going to be the systems where everyone individually does it. You know, like. <laughs> Co correct. As, well, um, as Barb pointed out, there's no self responsibility otherwise. But is it also <coughs> not just because of that, though? Is it also because then you're not making a community like sort of central position, but anywhere that a human is, is also going to be giving back? Correct. So instead of taking from one place and giving back to another, you're taking from the place that you're living in and giving back to the place you're living in. So that's what needs to happen in the long run. Yep. You become sensitive to the changes then, wouldn't you, too? What's going on more connected to it? Of course, you can measure the changes. The problem with living in cities oftentimes is that we're not seeing the damage we're doing by the choices we make. Whereas when, you, when you're living in a place where you can see directly the damage that happens if you make a certain choice and also the benefits that happen when you make a different one, now, now you've got a far l larger impetus to change and bring your life in harmony with the thing that benefits yeah and understand laws at the same time of course yeah that's the subsequent result is yeah. that you get to understand god's laws and why that works as well but yeah you can think if you you think too if you if you talked about all these principles to the next generation of children like the people the kids between five and ten and if you had a, had a and you had a scheme like that going Man, by the time they become 20 or 30, maybe they'd be making different choices. See, the current generation of children that have now grown into adults, like in their early 20s or late teens, many of them have no idea about the damage that they do to the environment based on the choices they make. Uh, and that's particularly the case in the Western world, but it's sort of the case in most places of the world, whether they're a developed country or an undeveloped one. The new generation is just so fascinated with the technological advancements of humanity that they're not considering the ramifications of all of the areas of humanity and what's going on. Yeah. yeah. Courtney? With what you're just saying about the young, younger generation, how, like, do you think that there's much hope for, for that to shift emotionally, or do you think that the younger generation is going to be like the last? To to the boat when it comes to the environmental kind well of stuff. you know the young the generation in the teenage years and early 20s and sort of in that generation they've got an advantage of not having as many fully uh, installed injuries but there's a disadvantage in that most of their addictions are being met whereas the previous generations had less of their addictions being met so so they have some advantages in that they don't have to process as much but some disadvantages in that their injuries are, b are worse. So, you know, it just depends a bit on how they're led really by people in their generation that they respect into a new place really. But the very young generation obviously is getting seduced by, 
you know, technological things that are going on. I'm talking about the generation that's now just going to school, you know, four to ten year age. That that generation is also getting seduced by the same things. And the problem with that is that they're not learning about how to the, how to change their personal life to impact the environment or the world in a better way. Yeah, Tris. They're not really learning how to make an impact at all. Not really, no. They're just using the world to their own advantage without any consider consideration of the ramifications of that choice. I find that most kids that I've dealt with or that I've talked to, they're, they're not, not even intellectually aware that they can create. Yes. And that their creations mean anything. And that they can have some long-term positive effects on the rest of the world in the long term if they chose differently. Mm. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the way the world is at the moment, it's sort of poised to really get worse or potentially get better. But it just depends on how majority of us are react. You know, you, you can see through your own processes that every every way you've reacted to your addictions, you can see that you're pretty stable with wanting them, right? Pretty demanding about having them. So that's an indication. That's how hard it is to give an addiction up. So if you think you're a little child who's had only their addictions met until they're 10, 11, 12 years of age, imagine how hard they're going to find giving them up. Um, they're going to find it pretty hard, but because they've only had them installed for 10, 11, 12 years of age, um, the reality is once they choose to give them up, they could give them up quite rapidly. It just depends on the choices they make as to whether they want to be loving or not really yeah yeah so there's a lot of potential but a lot of it begins by providing evidence to people that a change is possible and what the change is you know you've got to provide an answer rather than just pointing out problems you know this is something i'm teaching at the teams with us is a lot of times they come to me with problems but with no solution <laughs> I'm going, well, you know, you got, you got, you've got a logical thinking capacity. You've got the ability to postulate a solution. What's the solution? A, a solution that meets economy, function principles, life principles. What are the solutions? Even te technologically, there's solutions to most problems. Um, but most people just want to present you with a problem because they want you to fix the problem, right? And you've got to get away from that. You've got to be ready to identify problems, pre present possible solutions, document the possible solutions, choose the best solution, and present that best solution to the world. That requires effort, you know. An understanding of a scientific process of change. Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. So when we do our practical tomorrow, what you'll find is you get so involved in the actual doing that you forget the motivation. And this is where most people run into motivational problems. They forget what they've learnt and they only, they feel exhausted by the doing and they forget their underlying primary motivations. And this is one of the things I want to illustrate to you tomorrow. There's hard work to be done. Uh, to recover an environment and the key is to remain connected to your goals as to the reasons why you're doing it while you're doing it because as soon as you wait away from those goals you you're gonna you just gonna be there slogging it out you detune from yourself you detune from the environment then and you're just doing work then you know forgetting the reason why you're doing it and and it's very important for you to have that experience of having to do the hard work and maintaining a connection to the reason why. Because you have much more joy doing it then. Mm. Yeah.